I'm uh, happy to be here tonight and uh, glad to welcome each of you to this uh, discussion, panel discussion on health care reform and what it actually means for us. My name is Ryan Adams. I am the president of the pre-medical club here at Weber State and along with uh, Jen um, Farrell, uh, we are co-conspirators in this. In uh, She's the president of the sociology club and along with our advisors we've worked throughout this, uh, this academic year kind of investigating some of this. This session that we're having tonight is maybe a bit of coming full circle from what, what began last semester in October. We held a panel discussion similar to this in three parts where we investigated some of the proposed uh, reform laws and some of the rhetoric that we were hearing. We were trying to make sense of it and we feel uh, pleased and happy tonight to be able to perhaps uh, maybe not put the nail in the coffin but investigate what has taken place since we previously met and and now since uh, some of these things are have been enacted and we are happy to have with us tonight some professionals in their respective areas who can shed some perhaps unique perspective on how these laws that have been enacted recently, how they will affect their area of interest and, and profession. And so I would like to begin by introducing, first at my far left, is uh, Dr. Harry Sinekshin. And uh, he was born in Beirut, Lebanon, earned his bachelor's degree at Queens College, New York, went on to earn his MD degree in Hanneman uh, College in Philadelphia. Following that, he, at uh, Baylor College of Medicine in Houston, did his residency in internal medicine and a fellowship in nephrology. He has been practicing in Utah for 27 years as a board certified physician. And we're happy to have him with us tonight to shed his uh, expertise and his perspective on, on what, these, what these changes in healthcare will do for him as a practicing physician. Seated next to him in the middle is um, Judy Hillman. And I promise I have Judy's bio here. <laughs> Judy also joined us last time uh, as a panel member and we're happy to have her back again. She's the executive director and co-founder of the Utah Health Policy Project, a nonprofit organization that's dedicated to creating quality, comprehensive, and affordable health care coverage for all Utah residents. Prior to starting the UHPP, Judy served as health policy director and research director for Utah Issues Center for Poverty Research and Action. In 2008, Judy was selected as one of 10 community health leaders by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. This and other awards were given in recognition of her leadership and community organizing. Judy was born in Los Angeles and raised there and in Israel. She has her master's degree from Cornell University in history and bachelor's from University of California, Berkeley, where she studied uh, history of medicine and German literature. Before coming to Utah in, 19, in 1999, she oversaw development and strategic communications at a community re rehabilitation agency serving people with disabilities in upstate New York. Judy was, uh, has authored numerous publications, including Utah's Four Solutions for Today's Economy, Making Sense of Utah Medicaid, an article for uh, Virtual Mentor, Ethics Journal of the American Medical Association, and others. Her work covers a broad range of policy issues impacting the underinsured, low-income, medically underserved, people with disabilities, and ethnic, uh, ethnic minorities. Judy is happiest when she is working on solvable problems, and this is why she has dedicated a good portion of her career to comprehensive, post-partisan solutions to the health care crisis. And we welcome uh, Judy with us this evening. Last but certainly not least, we have uh, Dr. Gary Johnson. He is an associate professor of political science here at Weber State, and uh, in 2001 uh, received his PhD uh, in political science from the University of Kansas. 
He, among many other things, his teaching and research interests include interest groups and political parties, public law, policy analysis, economic development, and urban policies. He, in uh, the fall of 2000, he, uh, uh, let's see, from the fall of 2000 to 2006, he taught at UNC Charlotte, and in the fall of 2006 till the present time has taught here at Weber State. Uh, and we uh, don't have enough time to list all of his publications, but he is a very published author, and we're happy to have him and his pers perspective here with us tonight. Before I sit down, I would also like to just um, introduce and uh, give some credit to our faculty advisors, Dr. Barb Trask, uh, seated uh, among you there, waving. She is the um, faculty advisor for the Dr. Ezekiel Doomkey Family Pre-Medical Professional Program. Say that ten times really fast and I will be impressed. She's also uh, an associate professor of zoology and has been really a key player and a, a great help in organizing and, and carrying this, uh, these not, not just this discussion, but in the fall as well. She worked very hard uh, to, to help pull those off. In addition, her, her partner in crime, Carla uh, Coons Trennelman. Where are you, Carla? There she is. She's a faculty advisor for the Sociology Club and Associate Professor of Sociology. Uh, she also has worked tirelessly and uh, done a lot to help facilitate this evening she also was very integral on uh, with the panel discussions we had in the fall. So we recognize both of our faculty advisors and uh, appreciate them and their help with us tonight. We will at this time then go ahead and turn the time to Dr. Johnson. Uh, we would like to just let you know the format will, uh, will be as follows. We'll let each of the presenters, each of the panelists, give a, a 20 to 25 minute presentation. We would ask you to make note of questions that come up, but please hold your questions until all three panelists have had an opportunity to, pre to present their information. And then we'll have a question answer period following where we would um, encourage you to, to stand and um, ask questions that, that uh, you're concerned about or that, that come up. And we would we'll gladly field those uh, until the the hour is over and um, and then out of respect for our presenters we'll we'll cut it off and let them get home to their families we'd also invite you to turn your cell phones off if you have not done so out of courtesy for our presenters tonight and we'll go ahead and turn the time to Dr. Johnson thank you very much Ryan um, I teach several classes here at Weber State University and primarily what I'm going to talk about this evening are um, not how health care got passed, it has passed, but some of the reactions to it, some of what we know about similar pieces of legislation from the New Deal and uh, the Great Society programs of Lyndon Johnson, and um, what health care uh, ramifications we'll see in the future that we know about, and quite a few things that we don't know about, but that we can uh, certainly talk about. Um, one of the bewildering ironies of the healthcare debate in the last few years, and particularly in the last year, where it was pronounced dead on several occasions uh, and has seen vehement opposition from the opposition party, not a single Republican voted in the House of Representatives or in the Senate for uh, health care reform, uh, or I should have said in the Senate, uh, for the final passage of the bill that we now have. Um, President Obama claims to be attacking the status quo in health care reform, and indeed this is a sea change in social welfare policies in our country. Um, and uh, the two main uh, logics of health care reform have been the same. They were the same on the campaign trail when pretty much every presidential candidate, candidate uh, campaigned for health care reform, and that was two simple tenets expand benefits, and talk about controlling costs. Now, Medicare under Lyndon Johnson 
he famously said in a, in a private meeting in the White House that if he ever told the American people how much Medicare was really going to cost, they would never vote for it. Of course, Medicare is one of our most popular uh, social policies in this country, and we would have to say one of the most successful. Approval ratings of Medicare are still above 80% amongst the population. However, costs have uh, expanded exponentially. The average Medicare recipient now receives around $12,000, and it's fair to say as a state policy analyst that the money that state governments used to spend on education, which was about 50% of their budget, has been eaten up by and large by two other social policies that states have pursued in the last 20 to 30 years, expanding Medicare payments and the cost of prisons for state governments. So Medicare originally covered only those that were 65 or over. In 1972, Congress made disabled persons eligible for Medicare coverage, and uh, we got uh, more, more than 15% of Medicare recipients are now uh, under that category. In 2003, Congress ex created a drug benefit, and other services such as hospice care and mammograms have sus subsequently be added to um, Medicare. Medicare is very popular. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, is this better? Okay. Uh, it's, on. it's on. Okay. Medicare has become very popular today. We don't realistically, no policy analyst really realistically expects Medicare to go away. In fact, if anything, it will probably expand. Now, Medicaid, which is the state and federal program to pay for health insurance, health coverage for people who cannot afford it, uh, originally covered people only on welfare. Now, children ages 6 to 18 under the poverty line, which is currently $22,000 and $22,050 for a family of four. And Congress has also set a higher limit, 133% of the poverty line for pregnant women and children under the age of six years old. In 1997, Congress expanded covers with the, the Children's Health Insurance Program. Okay. These are basically the templates for the health care reform bill that we have now. I'm going to have to get out of this and try to make it you know, a chalkboard and a piece of chalk is often better than the way we do things these days. Okay. Healthcare spending to individuals in 1965 was less than 1% of all federal <coughs> spending. In 2008, federal spending to individuals through Medicare, Medicaid, and a variety of other state and federal programs is 28% of the federal budget. The federal budget that Congress has discretion over to spend has been shrinking uh, throughout the 20th century and, and quite markedly in the last 30 years. It is now less than 18% of the federal budget. This drives much of our politics in contemporary America. The reason why we have polarized parties and very hard fought debates over social spending like this bill is because the slice of the pie that we get to argue about is getting much smaller. And therefore, the debate becomes much more contentious, and the stakes become much more higher for the political parties and the other political actors uh, involved. The battle for health care reform is a manifestation of these new politics, these very contentious politics that we have in America now over social spending. Uh, it wasn't just about health care. For conservatives, it's also about killing President Obama's progressive agenda, and that means a variety of other programs that he campaigned on that are clearly on the public policy agenda for the Democratic Party. And uh, you saw, if you watched the health care reform debates and town hall meetings and, and the vociferousness of those debates and the inflammatory rhetoric that we heard that there was a very clear intent by leaders in the Republican Party and members of Congress to make this President Obama's Waterloo. We know and, and all politicians know that first term presidents uh, need have a honeymoon period of about three months or a hundred days where they can 
kind of enjoy pretty high public support, and they try to hit the ground running and, and get big pieces of legislation pushed through while there's still some political momentum and they've got the support of the American people. And the harder uh, you try to pass tough legislation or do big things, your support erodes. And so stopping him from the outset was indeed a Republican strategy. And if defeated, uh, then health care reform would make it much harder for the Obama to administration to enact much of what they have clearly stated as their progressive agenda, which is blocking climate change legislation, uh, immigration reform, marriage equality, bank reform, education reform, social security reform even, uh, although President Obama has stated that he does not want to engage in that debate in his first term. Okay, so these are all huge pieces of legislation. This is a major public policy agenda for this administration. President Obama had a very hard time corralling his own party and getting his own members of Congress to vote for this piece of legislation. And he disappointed uh, many in his own party uh, based on what was happening at the time that was largely beyond his control, macroeconomic conditions like uh, a very serious economic recession and the uh, TARP bailout money for large uh, industries such as the auto industry and the banking industry and there were a variety of other scandals that I'm sure you're all well aware of, the, the bonuses for executives and the insurance industries and the car companies arriving in Washington DC in, in uh, Gulfstream jets instead of uh, driving an accord to uh, the, the meeting and asking for government handouts. And that process was a lot of brokering behind closed deals, which also was not as public or as transparent as many would have liked to have seen. Uh, the expansion of the war in Afghanistan alienated President Obama from much of the Democratic base, uh, and uh, a sense that he had catered to insurance companies. And uh, so uh, this was a very difficult, hard-fought political battle. Uh, the end result has been reached. We have a health care bill. And I think it's safe to say that this is a starting point, that we can expect that this piece of legislation will expand coverage any, even further and will try to do a variety of regulatory things to try to reduce costs. Okay? Uh, I think you know if you really look at the rhetoric over the last 10 years on health care reform in this country, Almost all politicians and all policy analysts agree that the current system was unsustainable. Now, whether this system is better is something we'll find out uh, in the long term. But one thing is for sure that health care costs are breaking the back of state governments. Uh, they're making it very difficult for small businesses to insure their employees. And it's breaking the back of the American family. We're just spending so much more money on health care insurance in order to be able to be provided health care. Okay, lessons from the last year and what we saw in America as this debate unfolded. Um, it takes social movements like health care reform, and this has been couched ever since uh, Teddy Roosevelt, and particularly since Harry Truman, as a moral issue for Americans, that we can afford to have a health care system that is much more expansive and that provides health care for all, almost all Americans, if not all Americans. And uh, as you've heard many times, I'm sure, we're the only Western industrialized nation that does not have some form of universal health care. Social movements like this one take decades. Uh, we know this from public policy. Uh, Ted Kennedy spent his whole life, at least 30 years in the Senate, the second part of his life, uh, working on health care legislation, and he didn't see it come to fruition. But many politicians spent much of their political careers trying to craft health care legislation. Um, other social movements, such as the abolition movements, which started in the really in the 1820s and even before then, uh, women's suffrage, of course, which starts at Seneca Falls in 1848, and we don't get the 20th Amendment until 1919, and women are allowed to vote in this country. Uh, the New Deal programs, the Great Society programs of Lyndon Johnson, uh, these all take decades. They percolate in the public policy environment for not just one election, but usually quite a few elections. And 
It's not easy. Why was health care reform so contentious in the last six months, particularly? Uh, the Obama administration, like all new administrations, made some tactical and strategic errors. The Clinton administration invested a great deal in trying to get health care reform passed in 1993. And it never even made it to the House of Representatives, much less to the Senate, for a vote. And uh, Barack Obama and his advisors and his team studied the Clinton failure very closely. And the general consensus that what the Clinton administration had done wrong was that they had done everything inside the White House, that they had not communicated with Congress enough, they hadn't gotten the major players in Congress on board, and they hadn't built this coalition. And in fact, the team within the White House had a lot of fractiousness and disagreements amongst them, so they weren't really a very cohesive, and the product they produced never got off the ground in Congress. And so Obama and his advisors decided that they would let this process start in Congress. Um, now Congress is 535 people who all represent uh, independent districts. None of them represent the United States of America. They all represent one geographic region of the country. And we know what kind of policies we get from Congress. Very vague and compromised and, and full of pork for specific districts in Nebraska, blackmailing the rest of the country to pay for their Medicare, and, and a variety of tactical and basically uh, difficult political strategies to try to get a bill through Congress. Um, the post-mortem on the health care reform debate in the Obama administration also is that uh, Obama and his team did not confront the powerful interests in Congress. Uh, that we now have incumbency rates in the United States Congress of 94% for the House of Representatives and 96% for the United States Senate. And this is based on special interests and the money that flows to incumbents who get about 10 times as much money as challengers can possibly raise. And therefore, there's a status quo bias in our policymaking system. It's very easy to keep something from getting done, and it's very difficult to get something done. And that's just the obstructive nature of a political system that is flooded with money and incumbents and who are very advantaged and, and quite uh, predisposed to the status quo as opposed to real structural change, whether it's campaign finance reform or health care reform or any other major piece of legislation. Uh, there was massive corporate resistance to health care reform. Particularly, we saw over $500 million go into the coffers of congressional campaign uh, uh, budgets, uh, campaign contributions uh, in the last four months up to the passage of the bill. Okay, all of that money was to persuade members of Congress not to vote for health care reform. Um, and it certainly, you know, not a single Republican in the Senate voted for it. Um, and uh, it's kind of interesting because now that we've had passage of health care reform, the Tea Party activists are certainly quite vocal and, and in the media and making their voice heard. But uh, the American Medical Association or doctors or the hospital administrators or the pharmaceutical companies, you know, uh, in fact, the pharmaceutical companies gave a huge amount of money to try to block health care reform. But by and large, 32 million more customers have been given to the healthcare industry, which is a large part of our economy, of course. The Tea Party movement also successfully tapped into public populist anger. One of the great developments in American politics in the last 10 years only is Americans' deep cynicism about our political system. That we currently have public approval ratings of Congress of less than 18% also, something between, and they peaked at the end of the Bush administration, they've been going downhill ever since the end of the Bush administration, that um, we simply don't have much faith in our elected representatives in the United States Congress to produce policies, much less policies that we might favor or that might match our political preferences or that we think are close to what Americans want. So, uh, the Massachusetts special election, no one foresaw that was uh, the guy who got elected and took away the 60 vote majority in the United States Senate from the Democrats, making it uh, much, much more difficult to get health care legislation passed. And the rules of the Senate are inherently 
very, very difficult to get anything done nowadays. And so uh, what we have is cloture, which is 60 votes to end debate in the Senate, uh, which is not necessarily a legislative majority, but the filibuster rules and the nature of cloture have made it almost impossible to get anything done in the United States Senate without a supermajority. And supermajorities are very rare in American politics. Okay. So that's the general appraisal of what went right or wrong with health care reform. Uh, President Obama certainly worked very hard, very cognizant of the notion that if he didn't get something passed, it would cripple the rest of his presidency. And here are uh, President Obama's approval ratings as of April 8, 2010. Today, I took these off the web this morning. Um, uh, he has lost 14 pence. Only 28% of Americans strongly approve of President Obama. His highest approval ratings were on January 21st. Uh, the day after he was inaugurated, which is pretty consistent for an incoming American president. Uh, whether you voted for a new president or not, you tend to give him the benefit of the doubt. But by and large, President Obama still enjoys fairly high approval ratings. Remember that George Bush's approval ratings the last year in office were less than 20%. And you simply can't do anything as a president of the United States if less than 20% of the public thinks you're doing a good job, and, and that's <coughs> fairly reflective of President Bush's uh, agenda the last year in office. He didn't, wasn't able to get any piece of legislation through and didn't even try. Um, what has increased is the strongly disapproves. Okay, so you, you're, we do see some opposition building to this president. On the other hand, we really like President Obama on personal approval ratings, which are still just below 70%. By and large, the country believes that President Obama is a, is a good man, and he's got an attractive and a good family, he's a good father, and he's articulate and all of these kinds of things, and that's important. So I think what I'm uh, sort of summarizing here is we have seen a steady decline in President Obama's approval ratings as this health care debate went on, and some of the criticism stuck. Uh, but he's still got plenty of political capital to continue to pursue and enact major pieces of uh, legislation through Congress. Um, we also know that presidential parties always lose seats in Congress in midterm elections, that uh, we, the country sort of reverse itself a little after electing a president. And very rare that we see the same political party that elected a president uh, be able to gain seats in Congress during the midterm election. So essentially one of the major political strategies for the Obama administration now is to minimize the bleeding in the midterm elections, although we do expect the Republicans to gain some seats. Uh, on the economy, 41%. On national security, fairly good. On leadership, even, hard, even higher. Uh, do we trust Obama on the economic crisis? Those are his lowest numbers for any given public policy. Uh, and I've used up my time, but I'll be happy to take questions uh, when the other panelists are done. Thank you. Okay, I'm sort of soft-spoken, so I'm going to stand so that I can project. I'm not using PowerPoint. Okay, no PowerPoint. And this is the mic. Turn it on. Yep. Does that work? Healthcare spending. And we probably shouldn't go on. Um, we're having about 45,000 people die a year because they don't have health insurance. Having so many uninsured in a country as wealthy as ours um, really hasn't, hasn't made a lot of sense. And it's also it's inhumane to boot. Um, so we knew we had to get started. Um, because of the cost uh, problems alone, we, that should have been reason enough to get started. Now notice that I'm saying get started on health reform because this legislation, uh, HR 3590 I think it is, who remembers? <laughs> Did I remember the right number? That's right. It is right, okay, good, it's sticking, it's sticking. Okay, um, it wasn't perfect um, by any stretch and I think Dr. Sinekchen is gonna elaborate on that point. Um, but <sighs> it will <clears throat> get us started uh, on a multi-year process of reform. So back in the Clinton era, when they tried to do health reform, remember Hillary Care? 
Okay, some of you maybe were, were just born or something. Some of you look so, yeah, that's okay. Um, it, it, but those reforms were not as sophisticated, okay, as this generation of reforms. We weren't thinking back then so much in terms of, of what we call the three-legged stool <coughs> of reform. So what are the three big changes, big categories of change that you expect to see in reform? Anyone want to guess? <coughs> three guesses. Good. Let's call that access. Give me another one. And, and Dr. Johnson. Cost. And what's the third? Quality. Quality. Thank you. So these reforms, the reason why the legislation is about 2,700 pages or so um, is because um, that's, that's uh, a multi-pronged, uh, many levers have to be pulled at once if you're going to get changes related to access, cost, and quality to sync up together and make sense together. And I can explain uh, what I mean by that in just a minute. One thing that strikes me, I'm going to bounce a little bit off of what Dr. <coughs> Johnson was saying, if you don't mind. Um, I'm struck by, I paid really close attention to what was going on with the Tea Party uh, people. I'm, I'm sort of, um, I'm from California. So when I come to Utah, I like to understand sort of the, the the, the, the politics and, 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 and the, the, um, the rhetoric of conservatism. It's become kind of a personal um, obsession of mine. <clears throat> well, one area, one time when I studied this was the day before the big vote, uh, I think it was March 23rd or right, March 21st, I can't remember. Uh, I just went to a Tea Party rally just to observe. And it was in front of Congressman Matheson's <coughs> office. And I was with a group of physicians. We had organized a group of actually 1,007 health care providers in Utah in favor of federal health reform called the White Coats. Thank you. Um, 561 of them were physicians. And a bunch of us went just to observe the tea party. And while we were kind of hanging out, I went up. Uh, several of us just went up. We're not, you know, very, very polite. Went up to some of the tea party folks and asked them to say one thing. Give, give me one thing that's in the bill. And they couldn't name anything. Anything. They say, oh, they're taking away my rights. Um, they, it's socialized medicine. They're growing government. But it wasn't any specifics. Um, what's odd about that is if you really, if you take the time, and I dare you to sit down uh, and, 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 and pull up that bill and read it. Don't print it. Just read it. And, and I'm going to give you a bunch of nice links that you can use. Um, go through that, and I think you're going to be struck. If you haven't read the bill yet, you're going to be struck by just how conservative uh, and private market based these reforms are. We're talking mostly about insurance market reforms. Um, so the hysteria that this is socialized medicine, that we're growing government, is really, really off the mark. Um, What's the basic paradigm shift that structures all the insurance market reforms within the bill is this. How many of you remember the purpose of insurance? What is the purpose of insurance? Spread the risk. Spread the risk. Thank you. Exactly. Spread the risk. Well, insurance in the United States has gotten so far away from that that right now the business model, if you will, the business model for the insurance industry is you make more money by how well you avoid risk. That's the business model. And I'm, I'm oversimplifying, um, but not really. The paradigm shift that we are making, that we started <coughs> making on March 23rd or 21st, is that now or gradually insurance companies will need to learn. If they want to survive, they will have to learn to make money by how well they keep us healthy. That's the paradigm shift. And then guess what? The private market can be and will be the main platform for a reformed healthcare system. We care about small businesses. In Utah, we care first and foremost about the economy. And if that's the case, then you do need to do something about small businesses, because the engine of Utah's economy is small businesses. You 
do need to do something and fast about the problem where small businesses do not, not, they do not have the ability under the current business model, they do not have the ability to share risk. Okay, I'll tell you a little story. When we started our organization, after about a year, we were ready to hire employees and, and offer insurance. I was so excited to be able to offer insurance. And I found a broker who works with nonprofits, and she said to me, <coughs> just between the two of us, too late for that, just between the two of us, you really kind of want to try to hire a young, healthy male. <laughs> and I'm thinking, wow, she's saying that. She's not even ironic, but she's saying that to the Utah Health Policy Project. Okay. It was weird. I thought, oh, I can hire the right person for the job. And maybe she's a woman in her late 50s or you know, whatever. Anyway, so that was, that was interesting. That business model is going away. Something else that I find ironic about the Tea Party hysteria and the myth-making out there from the Tea Party and so forth is that if you look at the role that Medicaid and SHIP play in reform, it's true there is a significant Medicaid expansion at the bottom of the income scale. And the reason, but the reason for that is that if you're under around 133% of the poverty level, you actually don't have a reasonable offer of coverage in the workplace. And so if you don't have a reasonable offer of coverage, it's actually cheaper for the taxpayer to put you in Medicaid, or the children in Medicaid and or CHIP. Um, it's actually better. Now, there's this sort of um, gray area between Medicaid and CHIP, bottom of the income scale, and pure private market coverage, and it's premium subsidies. Medicaid and CHIP dollars ultimately are used in these reforms to make it possible for the uninsured, most of the uninsured, to get their coverage in the private market. So what's, just from a rhetorical analysis perspective, to see the Tea Party saying, oh, you're growing government, yeah, you could look at it that way because we're putting Medicaid dollars into premium subsidies. Yes, technically we're growing government because those are government dollars. But you could also look at it, as I, I, as I look at it now, that you're using, you're leveraging public dollars to move more of the traffic, almost all of the traffic, into the private market, where most Utahns prefer to have their coverage. To me, that, that those, those reforms are whistling a conservative tune. We're expanding the private market. We're doing a lot of other things in the private market. Um, we talked about the, the shift in that business model, the paradigm shift, to make it possible for the private market to behave appropriately and manage risk appropriately um, so that it can be where most people, where most Americans get their coverage. The sad thing is, is that Utah did not have a voice in this historic decision, not a single member of our congressional delegation um, voted for it. Um, we're, very, we're probably the second most conservative state after Wyoming. Now, back in Utah, here's what's interesting, and here's where we could actually use your help. Uh, Utah has been on its own reform path for about three years. Um, however, the, 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 the scope um, of the reforms and the, the sort of goals of the reforms are much narrower. Um, and I would say deficient um, in comparison to the federal reform, uh, the scale of it. Um, state reforms are on a much slower track, uh, much more incremental track. The general idea, and this is also for the sake of contrast, is that they, and Speaker Clark is kind of the champion for state reform, and he says, why would you put a bunch of people on a plane that's on a collision course? He has a point. I think Dr. Senection is going to talk to you about how going into these reforms, I think we needed to realize more that we're already spending enough money on health care in this country. We, even before these reforms, which are going to cost a lot of money, we were outspending the next highest spending country by a nearly two to one margin. So Speaker Clark, coming from the far right, has a point. So state reforms, under his leadership, state reforms are first trying to go after all the waste in the system, 
and they're going to do all these payment and delivery system reforms and try to realign incentives a little bit, go after the waste, and then use the savings, maybe, to expand access to coverage someday later. So our state uh, is, has, we have a very strong sort of federalist bent. And by that I mean uh, Utah wants to do its own thing. They want to do things on their own terms. They don't want the feds uh, telling them what to do. So there were a number of bills, uh, most, mostly resolutions, but one really, really awful bill that passed in our legislative session that said Utah may not, will not implement any of these federal health reforms without first reporting to the legislature. That's uh, Representative Carl Wimmer's House Bill 67. And I'm telling you, that is an albatross on our back right now. Um, it, the bill was amended to say that Utah can never have a mandate on individuals to purchase insurance. Um, so this is a problem right now because, one thing I haven't told you, is that the fact that getting back to the federal front, we talked about how you have to pull a whole bunch of levers at once. You have to, you have to go to the trouble to make coverage affordable because you have to get everybody in the system. And it turns out that most people who are uninsured are uninsured because they can't afford coverage or their employer doesn't offer it. You have about 15% of Utahns who are uninsured by choice. Okay, those are the so-called young immortals. For them, you must have the mandate. You can make coverage as, afford as affordable as you want with your Medicaid expansion and your premium subsidies and all of that, but they won't, they won't play. And you gotta bring them in because why? They lower risk. They, lower risk. they have to be part of the equation um, immediately. So you gotta have that mandate. So, what, I, I, how much time do I have? Because I do math. Uh, it's five, 15 minutes right now. Okay, because I'm gonna stop in 20 minutes. I wanna hear more of your questions. I wanna just, I wanna just give you guys a few uh, helpful tools here to understand what's going on. Uh, um, sure. Okay. The first one that I'm giving you, those of you who really want to get the detail, I recommend just going through some of the summaries that are there. They were smart in Congress. They were smart the way they designed these reforms. While it's true that most of the significant changes, including the coverage expansions, don't really start until 2014, and that's they couldn't because you had to, it's, it's too expensive otherwise. And you have to make a bunch of other structural changes first, including the creation of these exchange marketplaces where you can see all the products on offer, sort of like Travelocity. That's all coming too. Um, big, most of the big changes that are going to be really meaningful and that are going to, I think, make all of us want to defend these reforms over the long term um, don't, take, don't take effect until 2014. There are some really important things that happen in the first year. Why is that? Part of that is political. If they're going to maintain these reforms and be able to build on them, and believe me, there will be year two and year three and year four of reforms, okay? It's gonna take some tweaking before we get it right. You've gotta have easy wins in the first year. You've got to please, you've got to satisfy some of the more urgent needs from some of the important stakeholders in the community so that they help you defend the reforms when they come under attack. And they will. They will before 2014. So what I've passed out, did these go out yet? No, okay. Passed out a couple of things. Um, one is just a, a sheet of links that I wanted you to look at I can't remember what I put on the back. Oh, I know what I put back there. Okay. Sheet of links, really helpful things for you to see the timeline of implementation. You can see um, a summary of the bill, which is better than sitting down and reading a 2700 page bill, right? Um, really good stuff, really exciting stuff. This are, these are monumental, monumental changes that we're talking about, I think, are the best that we can do in America. Okay, is that fair? All right. Year one of reforms. 
here's where certain important constituents, important segments of the population are going to get immediate relief. Seniors, very important voting block. I'm getting a little cynical right now. They will get the $250 rebate to begin to close that donut hole that we got when Medicare Part D was put in place. Um, in 2011, they're going to have a 50% discount on brand name drugs. Um, by 2011, that's one year, they will have no co-payments for preventative services. So we talk about realigning incentives in our healthcare system. We're moving towards a system where we don't have a lot of cost sharing for preventative care because that will save costs in the long run for the rest of the system and, keep, and get us all to be healthier. Tax credits, significant, 35% tax credits for small businesses starting immediately. Small businesses are a very important voting block, very important block to help defend these reforms so we can build on them. Um, other things that happen right away that are important for people with chronic conditions, no lifetime limits on coverage. That starts in September. Uh, insurers cannot deny coverage to kids with pre-existing condition. That starts in September. Okay. And other things there, um, I've given you, I want to stop, I've also given you on the back of the links page, um, starting this year also, if you're under the age of 26, um, you will be able to be, stay on your parents' coverage plan. Um, and you're going to have less restrictions around that than you have right now in Utah. So that's very exciting and I hope helpful to some of you in this room. And finally, I want to pass around. We need your help um, getting our legislature to uh, embrace what's going on and give it a try. And you have uh, moderate legislators in Ogden. So we'd like you, if you can, to get on our uh, mailing list. At the end, okay. If you get on our mailing list, we'll keep going around. But okay, if you don't mind. We need your home address, your email, your phone number, your name. Um, it's really helpful for us, and then you can also get emails, uh, regular updates from us on how these reforms are doing and, and where the pressure points are so that we can build on them. Thank you. I'm a little bit anxious about doing this. Um, I don't see anybody with any tomatoes in the audience, so hopefully I'll survive. I'm used to giving lectures of a medical topic rather than a political topic, so this is a little bit of an adventure for me, uh, but we'll see how things go. Um, that's a picture of me <laughs> taking care of a patient. How many have seen a doctor working like that any time in the recent past? Recent past? Never. 50 years, 50 years ago. 50 years ago. Well, things are changing, and the practice of medicine is changing. So uh, it has changed last month, and uh, I'm going to discuss a little bit of that. So I'm going to give you my perspective of how things have gone and what's what to expect. And um, I'll throw in a little bit of humor here and there. As you can see, uh, this, these are Tea Partiers who are against uh, health care reform because they don't want socialized medicine, but they're collecting their Medicare and their VA benefits. So where's the uh, disconnect there? And why is this important? If you look at the last 20 or 25 years, you can see that the number of uninsured has grown uh, tremendously. It is estimated that we're pushing 50 million of our people who are uninsured. And um, this is obviously not good because they don't have access to health care. And worse than that, about 45,000 people in the United States die every year because of lack of health insurance. And you can see that in some states it's a lot worse than others. And the number of uh, deaths in some states are a lot worse. Well, here in Utah, we are probably in a little bit better shape, but we're one big country, and we really should see if we can do this together rather than individually. And actually, even bigger problem 
is more Americans are underinsured, and this is almost as bad as being uninsured. So out of the total U.S. population, the number of underinsured has increased, and this is across all spectrums of insurance, whether it's public insurance, private insurance, we're underinsured. So that many of us think we're in good shape, we have health insurance, but we're underinsured, and when some big catastrophe comes along, we're in trouble financially. Medical bankruptcy is, the leading, is one of the leading causes of bankruptcy in the United States. And interestingly, most of the people who go into medical bankruptcy actually have insurance. And as you can see here, 60% of people who take out bankruptcy because of medical problems actually have insurance. So that having, quote, health insurance, unquote, doesn't make you safe. And how have health insurance premiums changed as compared to our earnings and inflation? Um, takes a no-brainer. The rate of inflation of health care premiums has way outstripped the wages and uh, inflation. This obviously cannot continue indefinitely uh, because as a country we'd go bankrupt. And then uh, the issue of quality was mentioned and um, how many unnecessary procedures take place. So that when you change the healthcare program, quality and building in quality is also a, an important aspect of the whole change. You can see here, um, up to 40% of hysterectomies, for instance, are either of questionable or uh, inappropriate uh, indications. And you can go down the list, and there's a whole series of uh, medical procedures that may not be necessary or are not indicated. And this, I think, is the most interesting. Um, if you look at our healthcare system, where is the growth? Is it in the person who's going to put the stethoscope on your chest or do what you need? Or is it the person who's making money in the healthcare insurance business? So administration is growing by leaps and bounds as compared to the person who's actually there taking care of you. Now look at the overhead of the insurance companies somewhere between 15 and 20 percent. Who can tell me the overhead of Medicare? Eight. Three percent. And you'll see in a moment the amount of savings that could be gained by cutting this overhead. Oh, here it is. Um, the commercial carriers are 20 percent and the investor-owned insurance companies are 25 or more percent overhead. This is obviously going to salaries, profits, and quote, marketing, unquote. The pay for uh, the CEOs of the insurance companies. I went into the wrong field. And this is a variation of the first joke slide I put up. Um, the, the Tea Partiers, again, uh, complain about socialized medicine, but they're on Medicare. And then this, I thought this was interesting. I don't know if you can read it up there, but this was a urologist in Florida. And uh, this was posted on the window of his office, saying that if you voted for Obama, seek urologic care elsewhere. Now, some of this has been mentioned already, but the early benefits of reform means that young adults will be able to stay on their parents' insurance till they're age 26. Seniors will receive a rebate on their donut hole. How much is the donut hole? $2,500. How much is the rebate? $250. So you're still out $2,200 if you're a senior. Insurers will have to cover children with pre-existing conditions. 
and small businesses will receive tax credits. So many of these provisions are really very good. And you will not be able to be canceled if you have an illness, which is very frequently the case currently. And you must pay for preventative care without copayments. And there'll be a reinsurance program to help businesses pay for early retirees. Now, I was asked to talk a little bit about what it means for people in my field, and I'll give you a little bit of um, my opinion. First of all, about 16 million uh, Americans will be added to the Medicaid program. So that means 16 million people who didn't have insurance will have some kind of coverage. And the reimbursement will be raised to Medicare levels. Medicaid is a low payer to physicians, whereas Medicare is a medium payer, so that Physicians will have more patients that they will see, and they will get paid more. So this is a winner for physicians, hopefully. There will be new business models. You'll have more uh, secondary providers like nurse practitioners or physician's assistants. You may see inner city practices spring up, because in the inner city, most people are poor, don't have insurance, whereas if they get insurance, you'll start seeing practices spring up in the inner city which obviously is an underserved area. <coughs> and then you'll get paid instead of doing charity care. Part of the funding will be to uh, put a tax on high-end earners. They'll pay a 3.8% Medicare tax. This is somebody in the uh, upper end of income, obviously. One of the major drawbacks is tort reform was not addressed. I'm sure you understand that malpractice insurance and our practice of medicine to prevent malpractice suits uh, is called defensive medicine, and none of this is addressed. It really fails to lessen anything to do with the number of lawsuits that are brought against physicians, and it neglects to address the issue of defensive medicine so that you'll get your 15th CAT scan every time you get a headache, um, and uh, you know, the, the practice of defensive medicine has been shown to be an expensive uh, proposition. And there will be continued chaos with payment rates. Most of you don't understand how the payment rates have gone crazy. We, um, the government has this formula for payment, and as of January 1st, the payment to physicians from Medicare was going to be cut 21%. Congress moved that up to March 31st, but as of March 31st, the payment by Medicare to physicians has been cut 21% because Congress didn't make any changes. Which means that if this holds, and Congress will meet again next week, if they don't make any changes, you'll see a whole number of physicians not taking Medicare patients anymore because most of them do not want to take a 21% cut in their reimbursement. Now, the Massachusetts health program has been brought up as the model for our health care reform uh, because there are a lot of similarities and I'm sure you've seen in the paper Mitt Romney uh, trying to distance himself a little bit from it but it's the truth. And this is how you'll be covered. If you're greater than 300% of uh, the poverty level, you're on your own. If you're a 56-year-old person and you're making over $31,000, you're in deep trouble. Because your premium is almost a sixth of your uh, income. And then the punishment for not having insurance in Massachusetts is really interesting. If you're uninsured in Massachusetts, the fine or the fee is $1,068. And you can see how that compares with some of the other crimes you can do in Massachusetts. So that is, is that really a crime uh, as compared to killing of animals or being a terrorist? And the cost is uh, incremental. You can see that for fiscal year 2009, it was $1.3 billion. 
So there's a, okay. 2006, Romney says, every uninsured citizen in Massachusetts will have affordable health insurance. And this was ballyhooed by the New York Times. Now, if you look at 1988, when Dukakis was the uh, uh, governor of Massachusetts, it's almost word for word the same. Have the number of un uninsured in Massachusetts changed? No. Same thing in Oregon, 1992, the then governor said, we're going to give affordable health care to all. And the Washington Post said, this is the most far-reaching health reform in the country. Sorry, didn't happen. There are a number of other states that I can show you examples of, but it hasn't happened. So the access to care has not changed in spite of all these states trying to bring up health care reform. I'll, I'll skip a few. How much do we spend? We spend $7,000 per person on health care. This is about three years ago. This is far and above anything, anything any other country spends. Two or three times as great. But what do we get for our money? Is our life expectancy any better? No. Potential years of life lost? Greater. Infant mortality. We're a developed country. Our infant mortality is higher than any of these other countries. And then for you grown-ups, the maternal mortality is just as bad. So Canada has universal health care insurance and they're the boogeyman. Nobody likes the Canadian system. And if you have insurance in the US, your needs are met just like in Canada. But if you're uninsured, forget it. Look at the cost. The cost in the US has way outstripped Canada's so that we're pushing 18% of gross national product, gross domestic product for health care whereas in Canada it's less, it's about 10 percent. And universal health care has been present for over a hundred years. Now, I, the first example I could find in the US was Harry Truman tried it in 1947, but it was squashed and it's happened again multiple times since then. Uh, we're not there in terms of the world uh, coverage of health care, for health care. So, um, I'll skip a few in terms of time. I'm, a fa I'm in favor of universal health care, socialized medicine, whatever you want to call it. Um, I think the health care reform that we received last month was a stopgap effort, and universal health care is really the way to go to cover everybody. You obviously have to build in safeguards, um, you have to have tort reform, you have to have a mechanism uh, to make sure that quality is um, kept up, that unnecessary procedures uh, are not done, but I think it's doable. And a couple of surveys, let, let me just finish up with these. Um, would you prefer the current health insurance system or a universal coverage program that is government run and financed? And this is a survey done about four years ago. 56% of us want it. The government should provide a national health insurance program for all Americans, even if this required higher taxes. Yes. So, I'll finish with this. Thank you. <laughs> 40,000 people um, died each year without health insurance. Is that the correct number? 44,000. 44,000. Is that because, um, would you say those are 44,000 people that die without health insurance, or die because they're not treated appropriately because they don't have health insurance? Um, I thought that it was, see, it's uh, probably really hard to quantify um, the latter. 
right? Um, but as far as I know from that figure in the Institute of Medicine study that was done, it's based on actually really practical. If you guys ever watch ER, maybe that's my generation. It's no longer, okay. But when you like literally can't be served like in an emergency or you're not getting a life-saving procedure, um, that's I think the figure that they're talking about. The rest is much harder to quantify. If, um, sorry, if a woman feels a lump in her breast, she's going to go to the doctor to get it checked out. If she doesn't have insurance, she might sit on it for a while and not get it taken care of. If you are home having a heart attack, I mean, if you start having chest pain, you're going to call the ambulance. But if you don't have insurance, are you going to wait a while and maybe die at home? If you don't have insurance and you're 50 years old, you might not get the colonoscopy that you might need. So there's a lot of it involved in preventative care. Plus, the people who don't have insurance get their care in emergency rooms. And that's really the worst place to get care. The most expensive. Part. And the most expensive. I have a question. Um, tonight, uh, just before I came, I watched the news hour, and they um, were dealing with uh, a representative who came back to California. Uh, and uh, he met with his constituents, uh, all of whom were very co uh, conservative. And uh, I observed that the uh, uh, points that were raised in that meeting were all the type that you described uh, uh, by the uh, uh, people who really didn't know what was in the uh, bills, but were so upset with the issues of uh, federal takeover and things like that. And, and uh, so he was regarding that as his feedback from his constituents. Uh, so my question for political science is how can the information uh, be delivered helpfully to people who are not even wanting to discuss these uh, issues that we have discussed here tonight. Well, the idea that health care reform hasn't been discussed seems pretty preposterous to me. <laughs> We've spent a year, uh, and I watch the news every night as well, and I've never seen one night in the last year and a half where health care reform wasn't on one of the news channels and one of the lead stories. Um, we have a very discontented population out there, and they are listening to their constituents. Um, and I think that we have a fundamental structural problem with health care reform, and that is that 85% of us have insurance, and we like it, and we're afraid it's going to go away. And that was a lot of the rhetoric. And as I heard one analyst describe it, um, having health insurance when you're healthy is like buying a new car that you haven't driven yet. You, you, you like it, but you haven't really tested it out. And so a lot of us who have health insurance, particularly younger Americans, um, simply are afraid that they're going to be losing it. And, and this is also when we talk about this cynicism, discontent, the Tea Party movement, populist movements, very inf inflammatory rhetoric. Um, Americans are, are deeply suspicious of government. We always have been. Uh, and this is a large government program. So talk about increased government and so on and so forth. And um, this is something that politicians never like to say. Politicians always say that they believe in the wisdom and the hard-working American uh, judgment, but the fact of the matter is that most Americans are not technically savvy enough to understand the ins and outs of health care and what it's going to do for them. It requires explanation. It requires uh, technical information, and it requires your attention span. And most Americans, uh, uh, that doesn't resonate too well. One last real quick point. This is not a transfer of wealth from the wealthy to the poor in this country, a la Medicaid or some other big insurance for people who don't contribute to our society. This is a transfer of wealth from your generation to older Americans, just like almost every public policy that's come through Congress in the last 20 years. They're not raising taxes on rich people. They're raising taxes on young people to support the entitlement programs and the 65-year-olds and all the benefits that they get from our system.
I just have a question. I work in healthcare, and I think the healthcare reform is going to be very beneficial to those who don't have insurance or who have difficulties getting better coverage. But I have a question regarding those who have insurance who abuse the system. I'm okay with having a re reformation for people who are compliant, but we have people who are non-compliant. We have people who um, doctor shop, who abuse the system, who are in and out of emergency rooms to get drugs, to get, what what is the health care healthcare reform going to do in regards to that as far as um, taking precautionary, you know what, okay, you abuse the system too many times, you don't have health care. Is there anything in regards to that? Because I personally think that these people should not have health care if they're going to abuse the system. Okay, I can maybe start that, but maybe Dr. Sinection should address that. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, well, one of the reasons why we, we call this comprehensive health reform um, is, is that it's, it's really trying to, that there's a whole part of it that's really involving uh, uh, cultivating personal responsibility and, and wellness um, uh, navigation and consumer health assistance. But, you know, I think that what you're describing in terms of abusing the system um, is not as big a problem with consumers as is often thought. Um, believe it or not, and one of the reasons why I think Dr. Sinection is right, that we needed better tort reforms. Um, there are some tort reform measures in the bill, but they're largely pilot programs um, to try and see what works. Um, tort reforms are very weak, because it's not so much the consumer that's overusing um, or inappropriately using the system. Um, it's the provider. And some of that is happening because of defensive medicine. Or we don't have the right incentives in our payment system. So right now, um, to oversimplify, a physician is paid more the more procedures they, they um, recommend. Um, what we need to do, and the reforms have many, many pages devoted to this, is learn how to reward and pay providers for the benefit that they provide. Um, to make a long is called pay for benefit or pay for performance. We're sort of slowly moving in that direction, starting with a lot of experimentation. But the reason why the reforms have a lot of consumer education and consumer engagement, navigation kinds of things going on, is that research, research shows that the more information consumers have about what procedures they need or don't need, the less likely they are to overuse the system, um, less likely than, than the provider, if that, I don't know if that helps. Thank you, you've done a very good job. In Mike Levitt's exit interview from HEW, I think he did an excellent job of stating the issue. And that is, you go back to the 18% of GD, GDP, 12% versus other countries. In economic terms, that creates a crowding out problem. So the issue is not just about health care. It's also about the dollars we don't have available to spend, for example, on education. And you need to look at where the United States stands on K-12 education. We're 25th in math, 24th in science. Latest statistics says we graduate less than 70% from high school. And that doesn't even address the issue of quality. And he said it very eloquently. Until we saw the health care problem, health care cost problem, the United States never again has a chance of being competitive. My question to you, primarily Dr. Johnson, is why don't we frame the issue in that simple terms? Back to this gentleman's issue, how you educate the public. Well, the problem is that no politician, including Democrats or progressives, are willing to defend government. We're so used to the idea that we're going to elect people who say, I'm going to go to Washington, D.C. because I hate Washington, D.C. and everything they do, so please elect me to represent you so I can go destroy the very services that you want and crave and need so badly. And so that circularity of illogic, which the voter has bought into, 
No one, not even Barack Obama, has stood up and said, hey, do you like the interstate highway system? Do you like the national defense system that we have? Do you like Social Security? These are all wildly popular government programs. But no one ever defends government. And that's why Americans are so cynical and jaded. But you don't. Nine percent of the average American's premiums go to cover the uninsured. As a good capitalist, I want every other SOB and have to buy insurance, so my premiums will go down. Now, I'm pragmatic about that and tell them selfish, but that's what you think of putting them in selfish mode in order to see what really needs to be done. Well, I have confidence in the American public, but we have got to educate them what the real issue is and in the bigger framework. And we have to, everybody, Nobody likes taxes. Everybody says they want to reduce taxes. And we are going to, believe me, no politician is ever going to be able to reduce your taxes, at least for the next 20 or 30 years. It's ridiculous to even propose it. Americans want these government services. Um, and, but we don't think it's fair. And we don't like our tax system. We think that the other guy isn't paying their fair share, and I am. And no politician will defend that either. And you're absolutely right about opportunity costs. The money we spend on health care is money that we don't spend on other things that we desperately need. Not investing in education, and I know this is a self-serving opinion, means that we're seriously undermining our economic development and our social capital and our ability to be competitive with the rest of the world well into the next generation. We need educated Americans, that we need a vibrant K-12 system that we have a higher education system that's the envy of the world. That's the greatest foreign policy we've ever had, uh, educating people from around the world. Uh, doctors, engineers, many of the technical people around the world receive their educations in American universities. And state governments can't afford that anymore because they're spending money on these other areas. Well, we need, do need to move on other questions. Yeah. Uh, I just wanted to thank you guys for coming as well tonight. It's been quite, uh, information has been good. But the question I had was uh, with many more Americans getting more, you know, access to health insurance, um, you know, we're limited in the number of doctors that we have currently. Um, they're already overworked and, you know, is this, in your guys' opinion, going to lead to, you know, a six-month wait? for many patients to even get in to see a doctor, or has there been something addressed where we can, you know, add some more incentive to, you know, those that are actually thinking about pursuing that career as a doctor? Well, just uh, in terms of what the ref how the reforms are answering those really important questions, and, and, you know, what you're bringing up is actually one of the most telltale lessons from the Massachusetts reform so far. They did not have enough primary care access points, and it's been a problem. The rest of Massachusetts reforms I disagree with Dr. Senechian are actually quite successful. They've covered already 96% of the population. They have a 70% approval rating um, for the Massachusetts reforms. But how the reforms, in, in the content of the reforms, how they address this primary care access problem are a couple of ways. Significant funding increase to community health centers. Um, and I think it's assumed that a lot of the newly insured, especially the low income, newly insured from the Medicaid expansions, will be going to community health centers and they can actually count on, on very high quality care in those <laughs> settings. There's also a lot of money uh, for the loan repayment program. So there's this program now um, that you all should be aware of, especially in pre-meds, um, that you can get uh, your, your uh, tuition, not your tuition, yeah, your, your medical school costs repay if you agree to serve for a certain amount of time in a medically underserved area. It's a wonderful program, and not just for physicians, but for a whole host of, of medical personnel. Um, there's that. There's, there's, um, also, there are going to be some initiatives to, um, I think Dr. Senechian pointed out, there are some uh, new business models where we are going to be working more with mid-level providers, which are less expensive. Um, like, you know, I'm, right now I'm, I'm pretty healthy, knock on wood. There's no reason why my primary care provider cannot be a nurse practitioner. Um, even if I have certain chronic conditions, I can probably do okay um, with, with a nurse practitioner or a physician's assistant. So there's, there's those kinds of things going on. 
Um, there's um, also one of the things we need to do to improve the supply of primary care providers is to pay them more. Um, the pay scale, you know, for no offense, but the pay scale for specialists versus primary care providers is completely out of whack. Uh, so why would you, when you're going to med school, you, you want to pay back your, you want to have a nice house, and you're you're, you're basically asking to, to to be a middle class slob like me um, if, if if you want if you go into primary care today. Um, so. So anyway, those kinds of things are also what they're going to try to change. Um, in regards to the Medicare and the Medicaid, how their government-owned health care uh, programs, aren't those unsustainable? Because if you're putting out more than what you're taking in, just like a business, if you're putting out more than what you're taking in, you're going to go bankrupt. So I just have a question with that. Uh, won't this government-ran health care be unsustainable because it's basically the same thing? It's unsustainable if you don't raise taxes and reduce costs. <laughs> uh, but you're, you're absolutely right. California's, whatever it is, $60 billion in debt for this fiscal year alone, um, and Medicare's in a large chunk of that. I'll let the doctor go. Well, you, yeah, the system is unsustainable the way it is, but you have to... Uh, put limits. You have to uh, make plans to do to provide care that's proven. There's a lot of care that's unproven that's being provided because it makes money. I mean, if I'm a if I'm an orthopedic surgeon, the more back surgeries I do, the more money I make. But are back surgeries really proven to benefit the majority of people who get the surgeries? So you do have to limit care to a certain extent. Um, and then you have to also have tort reform, so the whole package has to be put together. You can't just insure everybody and not make some changes in the, at the front end as well. So how is Medicaid expanding with this uh, health care reform? in order to bend that cost curve, you actually have to bring everyone into the system first. You have to bring everyone into more cost-effective phases of the health care delivery system. It turns out the Congressional Budget Office score, they gave a score to the health reform bill, and that just means big price tag. And these reforms are more than budget neutral over 10 years. Um, they will save I think it was like 131 billion over 10 years, and then there were significant savings over the next 20 years. Um, but the reason why, in within the first 10 years of reforms, and the Republican opposition didn't like this part of it, um, they thought it was sort of uh, sleight of hand a little bit. The reason why the big coverage expansions don't start until 2014 is for a bunch of reasons. But in terms of cost. You actually have to find some savings and efficiency in the system before you can begin these, these really expensive coverage expansions. Um, and so it all comes out better than budget neutral after 10 years and very, uh, very, um, you know, bringing tremendous savings after 20 years. Uh, this question is for the medical doctor. Can you hear me? I believe the, uh, the essence of the whole thing is control of costs, which we've been discussing right here. And you put a chart up there indicating the unnecessary operations and unnecessary tests, and there are huge numbers. And I've gone through it myself where, you know, I've gone to a doctor, I've gone to my primary doctor, and I get sent to a specialist. And a number of times a specialist says, I don't know what, why I tested you, what you're doing here. So what I don't understand is uh, you say we're going to control costs, but I don't know how you police it, how you control it, how you get to the doctor who today is performing or recommending to the patient that he has certain procedures or an operation is unnecessary or a less expensive procedure, less expensive operation. How do you get to him or her not to be doing these kind of things? It's a wonderful thing to say we got all this unnecessary things and we're going to control costs, but how do we do it? You talk about education, Dr. Johnson, telling the patient, but how do we control the doctor? Well, I'll be extremely radical um, and say we, 
put the medical profession on salary rather than fee for service. Well, we're not going to do it with this bill. We're not, no, not, this bill is not going to do it. But, as I said before, the more cataracts you do, the more um, back surgeries you do, the more hysterectomies you do, the more you get paid. But if the incentive is not that the more you do, the more you get paid, but you, the more quality you give, the more you get paid, then maybe there'll be some cost controls there. If your patients stay out of the hospital, if your patients live longer, if their diabetes is better controlled, maybe you get paid more um, rather than the more back surgeries you do. I mean, I'm picking on the orthopedic guys, but you know, it's it's a universal kind of finding. I would I would chime in that that's probably fairly politically naive. The American Medical Association is a pretty powerful interest group, lot and they ain't going to take no pay cut. We can't even break the teachers union in this country. We're not going to break the Med American Medical Association. I am pretty naive. <laughs> <laughs> the real question I have is that part, the major part of this bill supposedly is Unnecessary procedures and, of course, preventative maintenance. I mean, lifestyle choices account for a great deal of our health care costs, which are quite preventable. And it's something we haven't talked about at all tonight. It's really expensive to die in America the last three months of your life for over 90% of your health care costs. There are ways where people looking forward can have hospice care and, and uh, have family members uh, uh, who they talk about and living wills in a variety of ways in which you're not in an ICU unit at $30,000 a day for the last 60 days of your life, uh, suffering terribly, I might add. A lot of the cost containment initiatives are, are starting with Medicare, which is where you see you know, the, the sort of costs exploding right now. And the other thing that we haven't talked about today that I find very exciting is they're going to uh, begin to set up these medical home uh, demonstration uh, projects. And what that means is if you have a chronic condition, uh, you need, your care needs to be managed by a team of people. Um, I, you know, I had a friend uh, recently diagnosed with um, breast cancer, and she, we were, I'm not a medical person, and it's a good thing, but there we were trying to coordinate her care and trying to help her navigate all of the decisions. Where was her primary care provider? Uh, not really engaged. Um, so the idea is that if you have a chronic condition, uh, but you, you're gonna have a, a teamwork approach to managing your chronic conditions. And I think with those types of initiatives, uh, that are very successful in Great Britain, um, incidentally, um, you, will, you will see a lot of cost reduction. Can I think we take one or two more questions maximum. Uh, Ryan hasn't given up the mic. Let's maybe see our, how are our panelists doing for time. Uh, is it okay? We have gone past slightly. Are you okay with building a couple more? Okay. One. Let's do one more right here. This gentleman's here. My wife died of cancer in 1975 in the KD Hospital uh, Intensive Care. She lived from the last month of her life, she lived from May 1st to May 24th. And she was in the hospital virtually the entire time. And the medical bills, incident I worked for the federal government, I had Blue Cross Blue Shield insurance. The medical bills came to over $30,000 for that 24 days. 24 days, $30,000. And I was amazed because I bought a house in 1972 that we had for $32,000. All right, I've had several heart attacks, I've had a couple of heart attacks. And I had to have one last July. I knew what the problem was. I had nitrostatin. I took an aspirin and we got to the hospital. And as soon as you walk into the emergency room, the best medical care in the world stops the heart attack. It just simply stopped. So by the time I left the hospital, I had trivial heart damage, according to my doctor. It really hadn't even become a heart attack yet. But I was only in there about 26 hours from the time I went into the emergency room to the time I escaped from the hospital. And they fought every way they could to get me to stay in there another two days or so. And the reason, I believe, is because I had Medicare and I still had that Blue Cross Blue Shield insurance. I was a gold mine to them. I was a, a really a gold mine. 
that last day, the last 26 hours, or the first, the only day I was in there, I had angioplasty in two stents, came to over $40,000. $40,000 for 26 hours. Figure that out. The reason, obviously, is because the people that go into that hospital and have nothing to pay with, they end up running up huge costs, and sometimes they die there in the hospital, sometimes costing millions of dollars. The hospital has to get that money from someplace, and they're getting it from me and people like that. That's called cost shifting, and that's very common. I just had a question. You, uh, I believe, it was Dr. Johnson. You talk a lot about the parties, you know, and how the Republicans were so against it. And my question is, you know, as an American, I'd like to see both parties working on this. You know, I don't want it to be a political battle because this is our health care, you know, and it's not a political battle to me. It's it's our lives. Um, and so my question is, what could we do, or what can be done in the future to make this a bipartisan or a country as a whole working together instead of politicians deciding what is best for us as as in one party. Well, you know, I think McCain put it pretty well uh, right after the bill was signed. I'm not going to cooperate with you on anything anymore. That anything that is bad for the opposition is good for me at the ballot box. And in political science, we have a saying that all politicians are single-minded seekers of re-election, and we've been trying to prove that false for about 60 years, and we can't. That that's the primary motivation of a politician is to get reelected, and so making the other party look bad is is how you do that. Now, almost every member of Congress understands that health care costs are killing this country in a variety of ways, along with several other very pressing social problems on the agenda. And let's remember that there's a hospital in the United States Capitol, and it has 12 full-time physicians to take care of those 535 people, and they never pay a penny for the very best health care on the planet, okay? So uh, they live in a different world, uh, and uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, my advice would be don't vote for incumbents. <laughs> and you just made a pitch for, I need, where's my sign-up sheet? I would say to, yeah, get involved in the political process. Uh, get involved in this dialogue. Make sure you sign up over there. Um, and and um, what part of the problem is that uh, uh, forward-thinking individuals like you, unfortunately, your age group, you look like a young man. Um, you don't. You guys don't vote, um, and generally, and you don't get involved in, in the political <laughs> process the way you should. Um, so please do, and and please vote for thoughtful candidates that do want bipartisan solutions. I will do one last one. Make it quick. Um, I also want to thank you for coming tonight because I haven't known a whole lot about what's going on and I haven't had time to look through the 28 pages or whatever. Um, 2,700. Um, 2,700. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I guess um, you all seem to have brought up very good points about the, the good points about the bill. And, um, I was wondering if you could think of anything negative that comes from it, and if so, what the most negative effect of this bill could be to us as the general population. Well, you know, from my perspective as a political scientist, it has certainly sharpened the polarized lines, and, and, and what you want is, is a moderate center that talks to the American people and generally provides legislation that Americans want. Uh, that's what a republic uh, democracy is, is designed to do. And so I think it has uh, polarized us more. We've got terrible information out there, and I, the, the doctor put several good slides up there that represent this. You know, when you've got an American who's getting serious, taken seriously with a sign that says, keep my, your government hands off my Medicare, this is someone who fundamentally doesn't understand you know, what's going on. Uh, and, and, and there are a lot of inflammatory debates and hurt feelings and political relationships and alliances have been broken and you've got things like 13 states attorneys general going to sue uh, uh, the federal government for health care reform on the grounds that it's unconstitutional and all this um, noise that doesn't allow us to work together to com solve common problems and so that's one of the negative effects but on the other hand that's politics so I, I only say that, that that's a short-term effect Obama saw a little bump after health care reform, America likes a winner. I think that 
we'll get used to it, this as a country, and we'll work with it. And Judy said uh, quite sagely that this is the start of a long process to try to reform our health care system in this country, and I, and I would argue it's a step in the right direction. The only thing I suggest is, I think I recommended this the last time, um, health reform is a process, and, and uh, there's a book by T.R. Reid, R-E-I-D, called The Healing of America, where it's really quite, quite an eye-opener, because you realize that even these countries like Germany and, and Switzerland, all the countries, even Canada, um, every five or six years they go into another round of their health reforms. They never solved it, you know, right out of the gate. Um, it's always a learning process. So what I don't want to have happen is I don't want the political bloodbath to mean that every four years or so, you know, we undo the learning and the progress that we've made. That would be a disaster. Could we get a, get a quick answer from the third speaker on the, what you think most negative? Well, I think the negatives can be that everybody doesn't get covered like um, the plan is supposed to. And the other negative is the costs could outstrip the projections. I mean, this is the Congressional Budget Office that's projecting the costs. Um, the Republicans have their own take on it, and they say it's going to bankrupt us. So that, those are the two, in my view, uh, negative possibilities of, of this uh, health care reform. All right, I think we'll go ahead and wrap up. Uh, we sure appreciate each of you being here tonight, especially our panelists who have given of their time in preparation for this. Uh, why don't you go ahead and uh, join me in giving them a round of applause.